Um, I'm introducing Andrew, um, who's with Bloom Shapiro and drove all the way in from Newton tonight and probably has to drive back somewhere out there. So thank you for doing that on a cold winter night. And it's an exciting subject. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce Andrew. Thank you. I don't mind at all driving here. I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old. And the, uh, the car rides give me peace to just sit there and ponder and think and reflect and listen to my music instead of the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. And I think the reason why Ed liked that uh, pitch so much is because he's the one always bringing candy into the office. And I think he needs some kind of shock collar or something to... Uh, <laughs> and earlier he said that I was the magician and Kringle made a comment about what's so magical about it. So what's so magical about it is my job is pretty easy. You just tell me how much you think you're worth and I'll just get the numbers for you. It's not quite that easy. Uh, if it were, I'd probably develop a patent for it. Um, and I don't have a copyright on this, um, so I, I didn't do that part of my job, but it's, um, it is available for, for distribution. Um, this is nothing new that's out there anyways. These are, uh, um, I guess, not original thoughts. Um, but uh, what I wanted to go through, um, what was nice about Kringle and Brian's presentation is I don't really see that process necessarily. I'm usually, um, this is the, I, the IP from plan to execution. Um, I see it towards the end where typically someone has a license agreement in place or they've already started up a business and they wanna know um, if they're gonna license it out what a reasonable royalty rate would, rate would be. So if they're negotiating um, a license agreement with someone to transfer out their, their intellectual property, um, how much could they expect in terms of a royalty rate? I, I assist in that. Or if they're a business owner, um, if they want to exit out of the business, how much, um, how much is their business worth or how much is their IP worth if they want to sell a patent? Uh, Brian had um, had a little bit in the slide in there saying you might want to do some pruning. Uh, maybe there's a patent or a trademark that you're not necessarily utilizing, uh, but someone else might be able to utilize that. Um, so there's there's an, a way you can transfer that and sell it or license it out for that matter. So the the first part of my presentation, I'm just going to go over um, some of the reasons for IP appraisal. Um, in my experience, um, I, I've done it in, in a lot of different cases uh, for a lot of different purposes. The first is I do work for an accounting and tax firm, largely that's, that's what we do. And um, when there's business combinations like a merger and acquisition um, or uh, there's, there's financial accounting standards, board standards, 141 and 142, 141's for the mergers and acquisitions. And 142 is uh, the value of the intangible assets. So there's a, an appraisal that typically has to happen of the intangible assets. Um, and then there's the tax aspect, uh, 409A. I'll, I'll actually discuss that quickly in, a, in another couple slides. And estate settlements, um, you know, we all die at some point, uh, rather unfortunately, and, and some of us, um, you might have a, a piece of intellectual property that we own um, and that could get passed on to the next generation and that goes into your, your estate um, and there's estate tax implications for that. So I would value how much the IP was worth in that scenario. Um, and then of course there's a lot of litigation um, Apple and Samsung are constantly uh, going at it with each other um, and there's, you know, I, I used, I actually just moved up from Washington, D.C. I, I lived down there for about 12 years and I moved up in, up here. This is kind of a homecoming for me in June, but I did work on, there's, there's so much going down in Washington, D.C. on patent related stuff, especially between Apple and Samsung that, you know, if, if you're a consultant down there, you can pretty easily get a piece of that pie, of that litigation pie. 
Um, but, it, but, but what it is in litigation is lost profits or economic damages. Um, if someone's infringing on your patent or a piece of your intellectual property, a trade secret for that matter, um, you know, it, it, you can claim lost profits. Uh, they're taking profits away from you. Uh, or they might be putting you out of business. Uh, so you can claim economic damages. And, um, and bankruptcy, uh, your business might be, as, as an operating business, your company might go out of business, but your intellectual property might still have value. For, the, for instance, Nortel up in Canada went out of business, uh, filed for bankruptcy, but they sold their intellectual property for $4.5 billion to Apple, Microsoft, Research in Motion, EMC Corp, and Sony. So they're, they're out of business, they're no longer an operating entity, but for $4.5 billion, they s sold a fair amount of intellectual property. Um, and a lot of those companies like Apple and Microsoft, when they made that purchase, weren't necessarily purchasing the intellectual property um, to use in their own products, but in certain cases, they used it um, because of the whole defense mechanism of, you know, if, if someone else gets their hands on it, um, you know, there might be a component of that intellectual property uh, that we want to be able to continue using um, or defend against someone else from using. And even in divorce, um, if you own intellectual property, that could be considered a marital asset um, subject to, uh, to division during a divorce. And then transactional purposes, sale of the business, sale of intellectual property, a merger. Um, and then I, I had mentioned that I was going to get to 409A valuations. 409A is a section of the Internal Revenue Code, and, and the reason why I dedicated its own slide is I do a lot of work in this particular area, particularly with startup and, and emerging companies. And essentially what it is is um, it's the, a part of the Internal Revenue Code that you have to include in your gross income deferred compensation. So you know, might not be collecting a salary, but you might be getting stock options, you might be getting part of a bonus plan or there's some kind of salary deferral. Um, and there's, um, in, in if, particularly in the case of stock options, it requires a fair market valuation of the business. Um, and that happens, happens, has to happen on an annual basis. Um, and when do I become involved? It really depends. I get engaged by business owners, business brokers, and attorneys. Um, if an owner's interested in selling their IP or licensing out their IP, I might be, um, by, might be called in to uh, provide a valuation in that sense. Um, and then for litigation purposes, uh, I've been involved in some of those lost profits and economic, economic damages cases as well. Um, and I would be typically uh, contacted by the attorney. Um, some of the more recent cases that I've worked on, not litigation related, but more succession planning and exit planning, um, it's typically someone who's invented something, built their business, maybe got bored with it and wants to go on to the next thing or doesn't really enjoy being a business part of it, but it more enjoys the R&D and invention part of it. Um, so they would approach me and want to get an idea, a rough idea of how much their company is worth at this stage. And then, um, so that could be an informal process. It could be before they start reaching out to investors or um, anyone who might be interested in acquiring their, their company or intellectual property. Um, and that's, you know, typically what I would advise them is there's a way to do an, an informal valuation. It's, it's a little more upscale than just a back of the envelope. You know, here's in a slide across the table, here's how much I think your company is worth. Um, but if anyone's interested in that kind of thing, you know, that's, that's something that, that I do quite frequently. Um, and then when it progresses, um, that's kind of what, what I would call an entry level valuation. And then as it progresses, it, it becomes more, more formal. I would use all the tools in my toolbox and kind of fine tune that valuation. Um, in other cases, people have been approached by um, 
other companies, um, uh, private equity companies, or someone interested in acquiring their company, and they throw a number out there. These people have been operating the business, and you know, it, finger to the wind, that sounds right, but they want to have you know a second opinion. They want someone in there to to give them an idea of whether they think that's a reasonable value um, that they've been approached with. So that's um, another scenario uh, that, that some of you might find yourself in in the future. Um, and the approaches that I would use, um, sometimes when I explain to people what kind of work I'm in, um, I try to dress it up a little, you know, because look at me, I'm wearing a tie up here and I'm, I'm it's not, a, not that exciting, I suppose. So <laughs> if, you, if I tell them it's like Antiques Roadshow, but for businesses, maybe that makes it a little bit cooler, but I don't know. And, and, and so some of the approaches that we use is the income approach. Um, discounted cash flow method is basically, I would project out or work with you to um, see how your business has been performing historically and then see you know, where's the growth going forward, project out five to 10 years. Um, and maybe when Ed said, I'm a magician, I can also be a psychic and predict the future um, and say, I think your sales will increase by 5% and your profits will grow by 12% um, or something like that. So there's uh, that projecting out to the future and then bringing it to the present value. Um, and I won't go into economics 101 right now, but um, that's really the most common method in, in bringing to the, the value as of today. Um, and then there's the excess earnings method, which actually has its or origins from prohibition. When the uh, breweries were being put out of business, US Treasury reimbursed them um, for the value of their companies. And uh, the excess earning method was uh, the most common method to use during that time. And uh, it's still used today, it's still used in litigation because it's fairly basic, easy to explain in a court of law, um, uh, but not without its controversy. It, it's, it's, even though it's simple, it's, um, what it is is like it, you separate out your tangible assets, meaning your property, plant, and equipment, from your intangible assets, the cash you separate out the cash flows, but it's not as easy as separating it out because they rely on each other as well. So I don't really actually, even though it's simple, I don't actually use that method all that much. And then the cost approach is um, I'm currently, since, since I just moved up from Washington, I, I'm renting a house, but now going through the process of purchasing a house and I had to get insurance, um, and a, a week or so ago I was on the line um, with the agent, and he was explaining to me the replacement cost of my house. If it burnt down, how much would it cost to, to rebuild it? So essentially the cost approach would be equivalent um, in the IP world, how much would it cost to develop the intellectual property from scratch? I would talk to someone like Kringle and say, how much did it cost to go through that whole process? Um, you know, how much did your friends, what is it, friends, family, and fools pay, and all that kind of, um, so, some, so from start to finish. Um, and then there's the market approach using the real estate analogy. Again, um, I had to, this long, long and arduous process of getting a loan approved um, is having someone come and appraise the house, and they look at comparables, other houses in the neighborhood, uh, other houses in the town, what they sold for, similar with intellectual property or businesses. You know, you look, I would look at um, uh, certain databases to see in, within an industry how much certain intellectual property has sold for within the past five years. Um, and that's pretty good benchmarks, but also, you know, especially in technology, things become obsolete, they change all the time. So. Um, the market approach also has some of its own faults as well. Um, when I'm valuing IP and valuing a company, I'm, I'm looking at what are the primary value drivers. Um, intellectual property does wonders in creating market share. We were already talking about Coca-Cola. And how many times do you go into a restaurant and you order a Coca-Cola? You, you really want a cola, 
and they might have Pepsi, and the waitress always says, well, are you okay with Pepsi? And you're like, oh, yeah, sure, fine. But everyone, not everyone, at least me, <laughs> says, do you have, I'll have a Coca-Cola, please. And that's really like, that's a trademark. That's a strong trademark. Brand value is created. A brand loyalty is created, not just with Coca-Cola, but just think about consumer brands. Um, and so uh, when you're thinking about your intellectual property strategy, think, think about your, um, your brand and uh, what value that could create. Um, you're first to market, too. You know, I, I see it a lot where if you're first to market on something and you have a good brand name and it sticks, um, you can charge a premium on your product for that, too. And that's a, that's a good value driver. Uh, and then creating the barriers to entry. That's really what's so great about a patent is if you have a patent protection, you're creating a barrier to entry from someone else entering into that market. And the legal protection that's behind that and the profitability that it creates. And growth projections, what I really like to see, um, particularly in the life sciences and medical fields, is um, thinking about what are the, what's the growth possibility of a product, a medical device, for instance. Uh, we have an aging baby boomer generation right now, and there's going to be uh, more need for medical uh, care and, and medical devices. Um, and, and there's been a lot of, you know, a lot of focus on medical devices. And, and uh, recently, I, I valued a product um, or valued a company where they really were tuning into that, into that market. And then the remaining economic life, um, where are we in the stage of the patent? Are we at the end of the patent? Um, you know, we mentioned 20 years. You know, are we 10 years in? Are we five years in? How much life do we have left on this patent? But not only the life of the patent, but, um, you know, the next big thing that's coming up. Uh, your, you, is the product going to become obsolete? Is your invention going to become obsolete because the next big thing is coming? You've created eight minute abs, but someone's gonna create seven minute abs or six minute abs and you get the same result. I stole that from a movie and I can't remember what movie it is, so if someone sees me afterwards, please, please help me out on that one. Something about Mary, Something about Mary. yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, IP strategy, uh, I'll touch a little bit on this. We've already discussed some of the IP strategy, but um, this is where I, again, where I get involved um, and when I'm discussing with the IP owners and the business owners is knowing when to buy and sell a portion of your IP por portfolio. Um, are you part of that pruning process? Do you, do you really need it anymore? Or is, is someone else better able to utilize the technology that you've developed? Um, or knowing when and how to license out the rights to a particular patent or technology. And understanding how to structure your IP tra transactions to maximize value and protect against infringements. One thing I like to help people out on doing is reviewing IP activity in the marketplace. And I, I um, some kind of tom sometimes get engaged to uh, look at other license agreements within an industry just to find out what's the competitive landscape out there. What are your competitors doing? Or if someone, if you're looking for someone to acquire your company or IP, um, you know, w w who's out there doing that ac ac acquisition? So I have access to a database called KT Mine. I, some of you might have heard of that. Um, so I, that kind of gives you an idea of who's out there acquiring in your industry or who are your competitors or what are they doing. Um, another thing is trade shows or trade magazines. Um, you know, I know they just had the Las Vegas Consumer Electronics Show and I saw something today about some of the tech trends that were coming out of that. Um, the Internet of Things is the big buzzword out there. Um, people are getting richer and lazier and the Internet of Things is becoming um, you know, such a, uh, you know, a smart pet, pet, pet feeders and self-watering flower pots, that stuff like that is, um, um, you know, really some of the trends that are going on out there with uh, the Internet of Things. And cars are becoming the next um, supercomputer. They're becoming smarter than we are. Um, and what else did I see? Oh, drones. A lot of drones were up there on the, on the, at the consumer electronics. And um, 
scary to a degree, but really pretty cool too. I want one. Um, and then commercializing your IP, that could come about several different ways through a transfer or license. Again, if you're, uh, you know, I could be engaged to, um, uh, in certain cases, to locate particular players in a market. And when, I, when I'm looking at valuing intellectual property, here are some of the resources I go to, license agreements, patent filings, trademark filings, filings and merger and acquisition disclosures. Uh, license agreements um, has been a, a pretty big focus um, of mine over the years. It's, uh, and I, I think it's an excellent resource for the, a source of royalty rates and, and potential value information and how to structure a deal um, going out to the market, seeing what's out there. Um, and, and reasons why companies might license out their intellectual property is to generate revenue license out old or unused intellectual property or increase the value of their IP portfolio. And companies license in, uh, Ed had mentioned in, um, you know, licensing in technology uh, so you can gain a competitive advantage or there's synergies there to make your product better um, or to avoid any patent infringement. And where do I get license agreements? Uh, KT Mine is the database that I mentioned, but really what KT Mine is doing is they're, they're getting their license agreements from public SEC filings. Um, publicly traded companies have to file material contracts uh, with the SEC, and um, a lot of the times the, uh, what's considered a material contract is, uh, is a license agreement. Um, and then re reviewing license agreements could be a great way of uh, assisting in contract negotiations and, and doing competitive industry research, research uh, determining the value of the IP, and it allows you to, to track IP being exploited in the given industry, and it allows you to identify partners and players at, active in licensing technologies. And uh, typical royalty payments, I, I had, was able to get some statistics from KT Mine. Uh, it's just a little pie chart here on software royalty payments. Um, the reason why I pick software is because of this per unit component that's in the orange. Um, typically, you'll see a royalty, a running royalty on sales, be it net sales or gross sales, but software could be on a per unit basis, be it um, by user or by, um, uh, by license by software license. Um, so that's why I included software because it has something typically a little different than uh, on just a straight up sales basis. Um, so I've been discussing li the licensing route. You know, people want to license out their, their IP because they don't, some people don't necessarily want to start up a business. They want to be the inventor. They want to be the idea generator um, and generate wealth through that means. Other people I've worked with uh, want to start up their company. And again, I'm usually um, really towards the end of this phase anyways, it, more in the exit strategy. But this is just from conversations that I've had with uh, business owners. And, and, uh, and my f usually my first question is, why did you get into this business? Because I always like to hear their story. Um, and s in, in one case, it's because they didn't have someone, they wanted to license out, they weren't really interested in starting a business, but they couldn't find a suitable licensee for the intellectual property. And they really thought that they had something, so they started the business. Um, and then they exited and made a lot of money a few years down the road. Um, and their intellectual property was a solid foundation for their new company. Um, other people want to get into that, that startup business. Um, everyone has their different motives, but I'm, again, I'm just saying what, I, what I've heard was uh, that that potential for acquisition further on down the road, or maybe they're the next Mark Zuckerberg and they're going to get make billions um, by going public. Um, and then there's that potential return to um, the friends, family, and fools. Uh, not just to the inventor, but also to if, if they got seed money from a research institution or from other investors. <clears throat> um, 
during that interview process, usually the management interview is the first part of the process of doing evaluation. Um, that uh, I've been told that the startups usually create value more quickly than, than the intellectual property. So royalties may flow in sooner from our licensing deal um, that, that you might be, when you license out your intellectual property, you might be getting some revenue, a revenue stream from that. Um, so that might happen a lot quicker than when you're a startup company and you're starting really from the ground up. Um, a lot of cases you're losing money um, before you're making any money. Um, so licensing has a lot of upfront work, but overall it's less than a startup once agreements are negotiated. And then from the acquisition perspective, there are a lot of established companies that aren't well suited to generating new lines of business. Um, so they grow by acquiring companies. Um, they, they look to, mer to mergers and acquisitions as an alternative to having their own R&D departments because they don't have that capacity to do that. Or, um, not only is it a capacity thing, but they, someone else just came up with a better idea than they did. Um, and they'll pay a premium for the small companies that, that create that synergy. And I think, um, yeah, questions. I would say it's realistic because it seems to be happening a lot. Um, so I deal in the world typically of fair market value. And when I see the, the prices that Facebook and Twitter are paying for things that um, I don't necessarily consider that face mark, fair market value, but um, more investment value, they pay that premium because they see some kind of synergy um, or because Facebook, I'm told that people don't use Facebook as much as they used to. So if people aren't using, if, if Facebook itself is being phased out, they want to have that next big thing that's only, you know, two years old. So that's why they pay that premium. Um, but I can't say it's unrealistic because it happens a lot. <laughs> I just, it's hard to play, it's, it is hard to put a value on that. Um, so I, I, another thing that I've noticed is, is uh, companies paying a premium are, are um, the companies that used to do film like uh, Polaroid or Kodak. They no longer make film anymore. They're into medical device products that have imagery and they're paying premiums for those type of companies. So that's something that if someone were to approach me and say, I have this great medical device, it, includes this type of technology that I think Polaroid might be interested in, it might warrant a, a premium beyond just what I think the typical fair market value is in there for that. Yeah, I think you have to, you have to go through the process of litigation to prove that you had lost profits and then there's the whole issue of whether the damages that were paid to you were punitive or um, what's the other word? Compensatory, yes, thank you. Um, and then there's tax implications of you know, punitive damages on whether you have to pay the punitive damages, whether that's something that um, is taxable or you can deduct from your tax. And Ed can help you out with all that information. It does, and that's where um, valuation really becomes more of an art than a science. And that's where also litigation kind of murkies the waters because there was uh, last month um, some litigation where the courts um, threw out a lower court's ruling. The lower court came up with a value um, that assigned 25% to an asset approach and 75% to the income approach. Um, and they had, the lower court had some very sound reasoning for that um, and reasoning that we as, as appraisers typically would use because it's not a science. Um, and, there's a, and in this particular instance, there's, there's empirical evidence that 
companies get sold, companies don't get held on forever, whether it gets passed on to another, uh, a, you know, a private equity company or whether it gets passed on to the next generation, be it, you know, whatever it is, it's the sale of a company happens and um, what the higher court had basically done was ignored that. And that's, I guess, kind of a long way of saying we have to do the best we can with the scenarios. You have a patent application I value a company with the assumption that that application is going to get approved or the assumption that it doesn't get approved. And obviously the value of that patent being approved is going to be higher than the value of it not being approved. Um, and it's really I have to do scenario testing and that's really where license agreement review comes in. Um, that's really where working with the attorneys comes in and working with the business owner comes in and really figuring out because they know the business more than I do. I can't come in to Kringle's business and pretend I know everything about it. I, I would rely on him to, to help me out with developing those scenarios of something and as well as, as Brian, um, you know, wh what, what are the chances of this application actually being approved or... Um, so yeah, there are different values based on, and then as you go along in the process, things maybe start to look better and you do get that. And if you do have a patent approved, then yes, it, going back to that slide with the value drivers on it, you have that patent protection that really increases the value of your company, absolutely. Yeah, that would be a good time to find an advisor to help you figure that out and project out, you know, this is how much it's going to cost me to get this patent and what are the chances of me actually getting this patent. Um, so you, what are the costs of that and then what are the benefits? You know, if I do get a patent, I do have that protection um, and how much is that going to increase my value and my profits further on down the road? Um, is it worth the distraction? Um, and it's, it, it, it depends is the best answer I could give you. But of course you have to, you know, you have to, you have to think that through and, and whether you, th you think you could do that on your own or, or uh, work with someone on that. Yeah.